Hey, my darling listening squirrels. Happy Monday. I'll be on live at 5 today. And we are on chapter 2 of the Dead Finger. Ooh. I packed my portmanteau, which is old timey luggage, next day and returned to my home in the country. All desire for amusement in town was gone and the faculty to transact business had departed as well. A languor and qualms had come over me, and my head was in a maze. I was unable to fix my thoughts on anything. At times I was disposed to believe that my wits were deserting me, at others that I was on the verge of severe illness. Anyhow, whether likely to go off my head or not, or take to my bed, home was the only place for me, and homeward I sped accordingly. On reaching my country habitation, my servant, as usual, took my portmanteau to my bedroom, unstrapped it, but did not unpack it. I object to his throwing out the contents of my Gladstone bag, not that there is anything in it he may not see, but that he puts my things where I cannot find them again. <laughs> my clothes, he is welcome to place them where he likes and where they belong, and this latter he knows better than I do. But then I carry about with me, with me other things, <laughs> I guess my other things, um, than a dress suit and changes of linen and flannel. There are letters, papers, books, and the proper destinations of these are known only to myself. A servant has a singular and evil knack of putting away literary matter and odd volumes in such places that it takes the owner half a day to find them again. Although I was uncomfortable, my head in a whirl, I opened and unpacked my own portmanteau. As I was thus engaged, I saw something curled up in my collar box, the lid of which had gotten, had gotten broken in by a boot heel impinging on it. I had pulled off the damaged cover to see if my collars had been spoiled. When something curled up inside suddenly rose on in and leapt, just like a cheese jumper, and what that is, <laughs> out of the box, over the edge of the Gladstone bag, and scurried away across the floor in a manner already familiar to me. I could not doubt for a moment what it was. Here was the finger again that had come with me from London to the country. Whither it went in its run over the floor, I do not know. I was bewildered to, too bewildered to observe. Somewhat later, towards evening, I seated myself in my easy chair to cut my book and try to read. I was tired with the journey, with the knocking about in town, and the discomfort and alarm produced by the apparition of the finger. I felt worn out. I was unable to give my attention to what I read. And before I was aware, I was asleep, roused for an instant by the fall of a book from my hands, I speedily relapsed into unconsciousness. I'm not sure that a doze in an armchair ever does good. I do that all the time. It usually leaves me in a semi-stupid condition with a headache. Five minutes in a horizontal position on my bed is worth 30 in a chair. That's my experience. In sleeping in a sedentary position, the head is the difficulty. It drops forward or lolls on one side or the other and has to be brought back into a position in which the line to, in which the line to the center of gravity runs through the trunk. Otherwise, the head carries the body over in a sort of general capsize out of the chair onto the floor. I slept on the occasion of which I am speaking pretty healthily because deadly weary. But I was brought to waking not by my head falling over the arm of the chair and my trunk tumbling after it, but by a feeling of cold extending from my throat to my heart. When I awoke, I was in a diagonal position with my right ear resting on my right. Wait a minute with my right ear resting on my right shoulder and exposing the left side of my throat. And it was here where the juggler vein throbs that I felt the greatest intensity of cold. 
At once I shrugged my left shoulder, rubbing my neck with the collar of my coat. In so doing, immediately something fell off upon the floor, and again I saw the finger. Ooh, so does Nick. My disgust, horror were intensified when I perceived that it was dragging something after it, which might have been an old stocking, in which I took at first glance for something of the sort. The evening sun shone through and through the, shone in through the window and a brilliant golden ray that lighted the object as it scrambled along. With this illumination, I was able to distinguish what the object was. It's not easy to describe it, but I will make an attempt. The finger I saw was solid and material. What it drew after it was neither or was in a nebulous protoplasmic condition. The finger was attached to a hand that was curdling into matter, and in a process of acquiring solidity attached to the hand was an arm in a very filmy condition, and this arm belonged to a human body in a still more vaporous, immaterial condition. This was being dragged along the floor by the finger, just as a silkworm might pull after it the tangle of its web. I could see legs and arms and head and coat tail tumbling about and interlacing and disentangling again in a promiscuous manner. There was, there were no bone, no muscle, no s substance in the finger. The members were attached to the trunk, which was spineless, but they had evidently no functions and were wholly dependent on the finger, which pulled them along in a jumble of parts as it advanced. In such confusion did the whole vaporous matter seem that I think, I cannot say for certain it was so, but the impression left on my mind was that one of the eyeballs was looking that one of the eyeballs was looking out at a nostril and the tongue lolling out one of the ears. <laughs> it was, however, only for a moment that I saw this germ body. I cannot call it by another name, that which had not more substance than smoke. I saw it only so long as it was being dragged athwart the ray of sun sunlight. The moment it was pulled jerkily out of the beam into the shadow beyond, I could see nothing of it, only the crawling finger. I had not sufficient moral energy or physical force in me to rise, pursue, and stamp on the finger and grind it in with my heel into the floor. Both seemed drained out of me. What became of the finger? Whither it went, how it managed to secrete itself, I do not know. I had lost the power to inquire. I sat in my chair, chilled, staring before me into space. Please, sir, a voice called. There's Mr. Square below, electrical engineer. Eh? I looked dreamily round. My valet was at the door. Please, sir, the gentleman would be glad, would be glad to be allowed to go over to the house and see that all the electrical apparatus is in order. Oh, indeed, yes, show them up. And that's all of chapter two. Let's, let's see if we can make it through three. Three, I had recently placed the, lighting, <clears throat> placed the lighting of my house in the hands of an electrical engineer, a very intelligent man, Mr. Square, for whom I had contracted a sincere friendship. He had built a shed with a dynamo, with a dynamo, out of sight, and had entrusted the laying of the wires to subordinates, as he had been busy with other orders and could not perso personally watch every detail, but he was not the man to let anything pass unobserved, and he knew that electricity was not a force to be played with. Bad or careless workmen will often insufficiently protect the wires and neglect the insertion of the lead which serves as a safety valve in the event of the current being too strong. Houses may be set on fire. Human beings fatally shocked by the neglect of a bad or slovenly workman. The 
uh, apparatus for my mansion was but just completed and Mr. Square had come to inspect it and make sure that I was right. He was an enthusiast in the matter of electricity and saw it for a vast perspective, the limits of which could not be predicted. All forces, said he, are correlated. When you have force in one, you may just turn it into another, into, no, you may just turn it into this or that, as you like. In one form, it's a motive power. In another, it's light. In another, heat. Now we have electricity electricity for illumination. We implore it, but not as freely as in the States. For propelling vehicles, why should we have horses drawing our buses? We should only use electric trains. Why do we burn coal, burn coal to warm our shins? There is electricity, which throws out no filthy smoke as does coal. Why should we let the why should we let the tides waste their energy in the Thames and other estuaries? There we have nature stopping us, free, gratis, and for nothing, all with the force we want all with all the force we want for propelling, for heating, for lighting. I will tell you something more, my dear sir, said Mr. Square. Uh, I have mentioned but three modes of force and have instant, instanced but a limited number of uses to which electricity may be turned. How is it with photography? Is not light, electric light, becoming an artistic agent? I bet you, said he, before long it will become a, th a therapeutic agent as well. Oh, yes, I've heard of certain impostors with their life belts. Mr. Square did not relish this little dig I gave him. He winced, but returned to the charge. We don't know how to how direct we don't know how to direct it all right that is that is all said he. I haven't taken the matter up, but others will I bet, and we shall have electricity used as freely as as freely as now we use powders and pills. I don't believe in doctor stuffs myself. I hold that disease lays hold of a man because he lacks physical force to resist it. Now, it is not obvious that you are beginning at the wrong end when you attack the disease. What you want is to supply force, make up for the lack of physical power and force is force wherever you find it, here motive, there illuminating, and so on. I don't see why a physician should not uh, utilize the tide rushing out under London Bridge for restoring the feeble vigor of all who are languid and a prey to disorder in the metropolitus, metro, metropolis, God. It will come to that, I bet, and that is not all. Force is force everywhere. Political, moral force, physical force, dynamic force, heat, light, tidal waves, and so on. Still, uh, uh, let's see. All are one. All are one. All is one. In time, we shall know how to galvanize into aptitude and moral energy, all the limp and crooked consciousness, consciousnesses and wills that need taking in hand, and such there will always be in modern civilization. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how it will be done, but in the future, one priest as well as the doctor will turn electricity on as principal, nay, his only agent. And he can get his force anywhere, out of running stream, out of wind, out of tidal wave. I'll give you an instance, continued Mr. Square, chuckling and seeing, and rubbing his hands, uh, to show you the great possibilities in electricity used in a crude fashion in a certain great city uh, far away west in the States, a go-ahead place, too, more so than New York City. 
They had electric trams all day and down along the roads to every direction and every to everywhere. The union men working for the company demanded that the non-unionists should be turned off, but the company didn't see it. Instead, it turned off the union men. It had been up its sleeve a deficiency of the others and filled all the places at once. Union men didn't like it and passed word that as a given, at a given hour on a certain day, every right every wire was to be cut. The company knew this by means of its spies and turned on, ready for them three times the power three times the power into all the wires. At the fixed moment up the poles went the strikers to cut the cables and down they came a dozen times quicker than they went up, I bet. Then there were some. Then there were came wires. Then there no. Then there came wires to hospitals from all quarters, for stretchers to carry off the disabled men. Some with broken legs, arms, ribs. Two or three had their necks open, necks broken. <laughs> God, I can't read this morning. Uh, don't be opening your neck <laughs> at their necks broken. I reckon the company was wonderfully merciful. It didn't put on sufficient force to make cinders of them then and there. Possibly opinion might not have liked it. Stop the strike. Did that. Great moral effect. All done by electricity. In this manner, Mr. Square said won't was wont to rattle on. He interested me, and I came to think there might be something in what he said. What, that his suggestions were not mere nonsense, I was glad to see Mr. Square enter my room, shown in by my man. I did not rise from my chair to shake his hand, for I had not sufficient energy to do so. In a languid tone, I welcomed him and agreed to him to take a seat. Mr. Square looked at me with some surprise. Well, what's the matter? He said. You seem unwell. N nice got the, not got the flu, have you? I beg your pardon. The influenza. Every third person is crying out that he has it. And the sale of eucalyptus is enormous. Not that eucalyptus is any good for influ influenza microbes, indeed. What care they for eucalyptus? You've done, you've gone down some steep steps of, of the ladder of life since I saw you last, Squire. How do you account for that? I hesitated about mentioning the extraordinary circumstances that had occurred, but Squire was a man who could not allow any beating about the bush. He was downright and straight, and the ten minutes had got the entire, and in 10 minutes, had got the entire story out of me. Rather boisterous for your nerves, that. A crawling finger, said he. It's a queer story taken on in. Then he was silent, considering. After a few minutes, he rose and said, I'll go and look at the fit, at the fittings, and then I'll turn this, uh, this little matter of yours over again and see if I can't knock the bottom out of it. I'm kinder fond of these sort of things. Mr. Squire was not a Yankee, but he had lived for some time in America and affected to speak like an American. He used expressions in terms of uh, See, he used expression terms of speech common in the states, but had none on the transatlantic twang. He was a man absolutely without affection in every other particular. This was his sole weakness, and it was harmless. The man was so thorough in all that he did <clears throat> that I did not expect his return immediately. He was certain to examine every portion of the dynamic dynamo engine and all the connections and burners, this would necessarily engage him for some hours. As they, 
As the day was nearly done, I knew he could not accomplish what he wanted in the evening and accordingly gave orders that a room should be prepared for him. Then as my head was full of jam, full of, no, my head was full of pain, <laughs> jam, <laughs> ah, I gotta go to sleep. Uh, head was full of pain and my skin was burning. <laughs> I told my servant to apologize for my absence from dinner and tell Mr. Square that I was really forced to return to my bed by sickness and that I believed I was about to be prostrated by an attack of influenza. The valet, a worthy fellow who has been with me for six years, was so concerned at my appearance and urged me to allow him to send for a doctor. I had no confidence for the See, I had no confidence in the local practitioner. And if I sent for another from the nearest town, I should offend him, and a row would perhaps ensue, so I declined. If I were really in here for an, if I were really in for an influenza attack, I knew about as much as any doctor how to deal with it. Quinine Quinine. That was all. Maybe it's just quinine. Quinine two times. Quinine, quinine. That was all. I bade my man light a small lamp, lower it so as to give me sufficient illumination to enable me to find some lime juice at my bed head and my pocket handkerchief and to be able to read my watch. When, it, when he had done this, I bade him leave. I lay in bed, burn, burning, racked with pain in my head and with the eyeballs on fire. Whether I fell asleep or went off in my head for a while, I, for a while I cannot, for a while I cannot tell. I may have fainted. I have no recollection of anything after having gone to bed and taken a sip of my lime juice. That's that taste. Let's see. Lime juice that tasted to me like soap, too, till I was roused by a sense of pain in the ribs, a slow, gnawing, torturing pain, waxing momentarily more in intense in half consciousness. Uh, I was partially dreaming and partially awake, aware of actual suffering. The pain was read in a diary. I thought that was a great, that was a great maggot. I oh, no. thought that a great maggot was working its way into my side between my ribs. I seemed to see it. It twisted itself half round and then reversed its, reverted to its former position and again twisted itself twisted itself, moving like a bridle, not like a gimlet, which later forms a complete revolution. Yeah, you know, I'm going to have to stop there, and I'm probably almost finished. I'll go on it. Honestly, read myself to sleep. <laughs> wordy, wordy, wordy. Let's get to the action. Get to that finger. Okay, hope to see ya. Live at five. Be there, be square. Love y'all. Bye-bye.